Hello traders, it's Friday, October the 19th. This is John Kicklider, Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here you give a market wrap-up for the past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in these final 24 hours of this trading week. Well, if there was any kind of uh, holdout expectation that Netflix and earnings in general would be able to help leverage a symbolic speculative appetite, I think that was uh, fully deflated this past session. Uh, following the gap higher that Netflix Netflix enjoyed post uh, earnings report uh, in the uh, after hours close uh, Tuesday. Uh, you can see that we had uh, the Wednesday's uh, gap, the struggle to keep buoyancy, and then Thursday completely retracing all, all those gains. Uh, so there certainly wasn't even enough enthusiasm to maintain uh, this individual company's share price. And uh, there's a lot of uh, specificity going into why Netflix might uh, slump after the earnings. Maybe there are caveats. Maybe there's industry issues. Uh, but I just generally think that in the context of the bias, if a market has an innate bullish bias. They will absorb the good news and largely ignore the bad. That's just how sentiment happens to work. And it doesn't always follow those very uh, explicit uh, uh, textbook channels. But clearly this was not what we were dealing with. We were not uh, just uh, uh, acting on the positive and ignoring the negative. Uh, we were clearly starting to pull back either uh, disregarding what this uh, positive earnings report had suggested or perhaps uh, fixating on the negative. Either way, it still speaks to a detrimental view on the general course of risk trends. Now, of course, when I focus on Netflix and I can say I say that this can be a, a catalyst for broader risk trends is because uh, Netflix is one of the FANG members. Uh, here is the Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, and Google uh, combination. Actually, next week we have uh, Google and Amazon, I believe, earnings. So we will uh, tap back into this once again. Uh, and uh, the FANG group, uh, which is the speculative leader of the U.S. equity indexes, uh, is also the leader of the industry that is most uh, performance-laden, which happens to be tech. The NASDAQ Composite, uh, or NASDAQ 100, uh, sh certainly showing that lack of enthusiasm. And it gets into uh, the Dow, the Blue Chip Equity Index. Oops. There we go. The blue chip equity index and the S&P 500, the essentially ubiquitous equity index uh, for the United States. And as you can see quite clearly, uh, lacking for performance, a pullback, and a significant one at that. Now, we're not back at the trend line, much less attempting to move below it just yet. But it is perhaps a little bit disconcerting. For those that are keeping tabs on uh, how productive buying the dip happens to be. Now remember, there are great expectations uh, essentially established or uh, cemented in this market. Uh, when it comes to performance, U.S. equities since the February collapse have done this. Global equities have been neutral and the likes of emerging markets have actually been retreat in retreat. All right, that is a, a pretty significant divergence in performance. All right, and it says where speculative ambiguity is starting to claw its way into these markets, and it's often uh, it's often labeled a, a stock picker's market. Essentially, there are certain assets that will perform. You can't just buy anything with a risk positive orientation. Assume it's going to go up. All right, that is. In that kind of environment, it's just as easy to tip risk aversion in a collective means as it is risk appetite in a collective way. So it, we need to make sure that we are much more uh, careful about what our assumptions are and participating in the dip buying kind of mentality, not that uh, taking quick pot shots at risk trends when there isn't uh, anything that can disrupt them uh, or if there is a, especially a short-term catalyst that can help uh, uh, motivate a quick swing and upswing in risk trends. But it should not be fallen back upon as a uh, a stable market, so why question it? And there's a, still a lot of that, uh, what is essentially complacency-based uh, enthusiasm or confidence, and that is not something that we should uh, apply to.
Now, looking at other risk-oriented trends, I start first with global equities, the VEU, the rest of world excluding uh, the U.S. on a closed basis. This has actually dropped to its lowest level since April of 2017. Also happens to be sliding through the midpoint of the 2016 to 2018 bull trend. All right, that's a uh, pretty dangerous, pretty dangerous position to be in. But individual Borises like the DAX after that, uh, it's still disputed uh, whether that was a definitive DAX head and shoulders neck, uh, neckline breakdown. Uh, well, we're going to really put the tension on that and uh, essentially force those that are trading DAX to make a call. Uh, it is uh, not one that I would make until there is conviction, either good follow through to the downside or a solid enough bounce that uh, it uh, curbs bears appetites. Uh, the FTSE 100 has uh, moved back down towards its own trend line support. Uh, we will see if we can get back down to that level, but given that Brexit uh, did not have any favorable outcomes in the, at the end of the EU summit, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, I, I definitely would not uh, be too confident in any kind of bounce outside of the risk, uh, the global risk sentiment. Uh, the FTSE MIB also very much a uh, unique fundamental uncertainty, add a little bit of risk aversion to that, and lo and behold, we are now at the lowest level since March 2017. Not a surprise at all. The more fundamental trouble you heap upon this equation, uh, the deeper the discount or the deeper the retreat for the specific assets. The same is true in the Asia session. The Shanghai Composite uh, is down now at a multi-year low. We're down uh, going all the way back to uh, almost four years, November 2014, uh, and there's no reason for it to really pull up unless policy authorities want to step in, and they often do, so uh, not to be unexpected. Uh, the Nikkei 225 coming up to support, trend line support. All right, keeping close tabs on this one. This is your U.S. equivalent or the closest to a U.S. equivalent in the Asia world. Uh, and I always uh, like to add in there the Aussie 200, the ASX 200. It's volatility is pretty impressive. Uh, great technical trading, particularly. Uh, but what's motivating risk trends beyond just the disappointment in Netflix? I think the Netflix shares response is simply a uh, a measure, a barometer of, of sentiment, not a motivator of sentiment. We still have earnings uh, ahead of us, uh, although Friday's uh, earning calendar is not uh, top of the list in terms of market movers. I didn't even include anything of substance in my economic calendar. But I don't think this is what is really motivating the market. It's only going to contribute uh, either to curb the risk aversion, which some of the uh, bank earnings figures were robust, especially the investment banking segments of those uh, bank uh, reports. Um, but if it's going to be the Netflix uh, response, then you know that the markets are just going to continue to extract what they want out of this particular theme. In the meantime, things like trade wars are still uh, very much at for, uh, front of mind. The Trump administration just uh, actually yesterday uh, announced that uh, due to requirements that they intend to uh, engage the European Union and Japan in trade talks within 90 days. And uh, they also announced their intent to engage the United Kingdom in direct trade talks as of uh, uh, after their uh, Brexit cutoff date, the March 29th date. Um, so... Uh, that's a positive, but as it stands with the uh, ongoing trade war now between the United States and China, still unresolved. Uh, and when you're looking at the continued pressure against the Chinese yuan, knowing that they're there attempting to curb volatility, curb momentum, and you're still getting pressure, uh, which is a little bit more definitive on the USD HKD at the top end of the tolerance band on a peg, uh, you know that there is still some pressure. And of course, that Shanghai composite, I will keep take more of my day-to-day -day assessment or more so week-to-week -week assessment through Aussie USD, I think is a little bit more appropriate and, and less controlled, of course. In terms of China, uh, by the time you're watching this, you might have already seen across the wires, but the Chinese GDP, the employment, industrial production, retail sales, and fixed assets, the GDP's third quarter, the rest of the debt is September. Very important economic round, but the markets are going to view it with such deep skepticism and well-deserved uh, because the data that comes uh, from the official Chinese sources is uh, considered by most to be heavily massaged. Uh, that's a generous word for it. But uh, 
I have this conversation often on the desk uh, with those uh, that uh, rail at the accuracy of the data. It really doesn't matter from a trader's perspective, though, because this is the data we have to go on. There's nothing we can use that is uh, of the same authority that can conflict with the official figures and the markets are willing to go with. So the markets understanding that this is questionable uh, accuracy uh, will nevertheless have to absorb the data and use it as the official statistics. Uh, and their reticence certainly lowers the impact that the data can have, but all we need is just a, a 0.1 percentage point uh, more aggressive drop in GDP than was anticipated, and it can raise some eyebrows, uh, insinuating that uh, perhaps things are even worse if this is a controlled version of the outcome. So uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of cognitive dissonance in interpreting uh, such data, uh, and it does create problems, but this is certainly something that I think better left to a, a more market-derived uh, benchmark like the uh, Aussie USD, which is very sensitive due to its trade relationships uh, with China. But uh, if genuine fear comes out of China, financial stability or economic health, uh, second largest economy in the world, as cut off as it is, it still can very readily uh, trigger a global uh, risk aversion. It can just as readily create financial crisis in the United States uh, as it does for the rest of the emerging market set. So uh, be very, very cautious in your expectations of how uh, the markets uh, will absorb this data. And it's not always just going to be a complete uh, overlook. All right. Now, in terms of the general risk course itself, you don't always need things like trade wars to trigger sentiment. Uh, with a, a slide, a uniform slide in risk-oriented trends, which is uh, certainly something that I think was a little bit more apparent across these other risk-oriented assets. This is so far the Emerging Market ETF, the HYJ, the Junk Bond ETF. This is 10-year Treasury yields, uh, the Commodity Index from Dow Jones as a risk measure, and uh, Yen Cross or a carry trade index, uh, all of them negative. Alongside those equity performances that we saw before, collectively this signals uh, a more meaningful risk aversion, all right, and an intensity of risk aversion that gets closer and closer into uh, a self-sustaining uh, level. When risk trends is its own motivation, risk aversion, uh, then we have serious problems. That's that underlying bias that can take something like Netflix earnings and deconstruct it, and paying only attention to the negative, ignoring the positive, and essentially accelerating that decline. Uh, this is uh, a dangerous kind of market. It could also be a manic market when it's on the upside, but currently this leans to the downside. I don't think we're at self-sustaining momentum uh, yet. It's still a ways to go, but you always have to be mindful that sentiment can be its own fundamental motivation rather than just the outcome of influence. Now, in terms of other uh, thematic issues, uh, I still think we need to keep uh, close tabs on global yields. Obviously, if those pick up, that can certainly add uh, to the pressure, but this is unlikely to happen uh, given the circumstances that we have around the world. There are more uncertainties, global uncertainties, and risk elements uh, having passed through this week than what we had seen previously. Uh, now, to remind you that uh, very nasty spill that we suffered in U.S. equities uh, a week uh, over a week ago was prompted in large part by the surge in global government bond yields. Here's a, an aggregate of that. All right, and we had gotten up to some very meaningful highs. This is problematic because it really suggests that the support system for easy funds speculative excess uh, was starting to pinch off All right, and encourage some of that risk aversion. That risk aversion kicked in, yields dropped off. Now, I think that this is probably going to be a little bit more persistent and yields remaining deflated uh, because 
uh, to maintain an increase in yields would require either central banks to proactively reduce their balance sheets, which they have yet to do, uh, and subsequently threaten to tighten, which only the Fed is really aggressive with as of yet. Uh, so the circumstances are kind of self-adjusting in terms of rates or yields, and then subsequently seeing it in the, uh, in the influence of risk trends. But this isn't the only, f uh, the only risk, the financial risk. Uh, we have other issues that are also uh, uh, playing through, and they're actually more targeted. One of the issues that I didn't really go into detail with recently because we were paying attention to so many other things, uh, but the U.S. dollar, which is actually rising, uh, this is a uh, trade-weighted dollar index. Uh, we can also get this from an equally-weighted dollar index, get a, the same kind of reading. Um, you have an appreciation of this currency, despite the uncertainties uh, that were uh, announced, I think, from the Trump administration, who had suggested that uh, the, uh, the secretaries of different uh, cabinet positions should be prepared to cut their spending by 5% uh, at each department, which is pretty aggressive. Uh, a reduction in uh, spending in an effort to offset the deficit, which in which it should be said, uh, it, the projection of the deficit has increased significantly because of the tax cuts that were implemented. Um, it, the reduction in spending can also under, c undermine and uh, cut down growth forecasts. It's a natural, uh, a natural uh, implication of this. Uh, and that can lead to uncertainty for the future for growth. All right. It also adds to the uncertainties surrounding the midterm elections. But the U.S. dollar is still outperforming, and it's also outperforming despite uh, uh, some remarks that are unfavorable for interest rate expectations, although I don't think they're particularly surprising. We had uh, the Fed's Bullard, uh, the St. Louis Fed president uh, this past session, who uh, very famously started to do a uh, kind of a, a, a vote uh, as a protest uh, for rate forecasting, because he doesn't like rate forecasting and only projecting one rate hike in the span of a year. Um, but uh, Bullard's a little bit more explicit in his uh, views as of late, and he suggested this past session that further rate hikes could uh, would be raising the risk of recession, and they were appropriate where they're at. Uh, now, this didn't cut down interest rate expectations. This is the implied yield, the red line. Implied yield for rate forecast through the end of 2019. Uh, so we would assume that, uh, r that further rate hike in December of this year and then three more in 2019. Uh, a little bit of a pullback, not enough to really uh, subvert the dollar, uh, but there are other systemic issues here. So then why is the dollar still buoyant uh, despite uh, some of these local issues and side effect risks like the, uh, the pressure that the, uh, that the trade wars as a blowback issue or concern uh, represent? Well, one of the big uh, motivations is the dollar taking advantage of its counterparts. Now, I emphasize this a lot because this is a, a dynamic uh, consideration. We assume that it's always static. It's not. The dollar's position as the dominant currency in the world. Now, it's going to maintain that dominance for quite some time, but as it loses that advantage, it can uh, materially lose altitude, and I'm talking permanently, not just a pullback, a drop. And it will also increase the volatility as people move away from the dollar, uh, whether for reserves or for transactions or for investment purposes, and they will diversify it in its uh, more liquid counterparts. Now, this is uh, problematic, and we're definitely heading uh, in that direction. But the, the point is, at what, uh, at what level? At what point do we recognize this in the mainstream sense? I think it's starting to, to spill over into uh, normal uh, headlines, normal financial conversations, uh, normal trade uh, talk. Certainly, it's a very high-profile conversation at, at the fund level uh, and uh, at the, uh, the bond trader level. But uh, I think it's starting to get into the, the mainstream. Uh, individual traders are starting to consider this as well. This is uh, far greater a risk and one that I think is a long-term issue for the U.S. dollar. However, in the, in the meantime, the dollar still is the most liquid counterpart in the world, and it will take advantage of a weakness in its most uh, dominant counterparts. Uh, 
So the euro, this is the euro USD, and the pound, this is the pound USD. Both the euro and the sterling dropped materially this past session, uh, and that collective retreat helped the US dollar. It also helped the Japanese yen, between the two of them, the dollar yen, the yen uh, benefit more. But the US dollar against these two most liquid counterparts are definitely absorbing a lot, m the dollar's absorbing a lot more of that, uh, that outflow. All right. So this is more of a, a mirror uh, of its uh, large counterparts, rather than it, uh, blazing its own trail. And that can certainly continue for the foreseeable future, because this is a pretty prominent and uh, deep well of motivation. I don't think that the data from the U.S. is going to be uh, moving the markets uh, through Friday, certainly. But we will see the euro and the pound continue to exert pressure. Now for the euro, obviously we wrapped up the, East, uh, the European Union summit, and while most of the interest was in Brexit, which was sterling based, uh, it, there certainly was uncertainty when it focused in on the euro area. And the question, of course, is euro area stability. Uh, that stability called into question because just like back in 2009 to 2012, uh, we're questioning the stability of the membership uh, of those uh, of that group that backs the uh, the currency, the eurozone members. And as you can see, the equally weighted euro index had a pullback. This is you can call this a head and shoulders pattern. I would not call it reliable. Uh, reversal, because with a, re a reversal you need something to reverse, and this is not a big lead up. All right, it's actually uh, essentially half the size of the entire range. That's that doesn't count. But the euro itself is under greater fundamental pressure because there was a very clearly uh, a contention between uh, Italy, the member who's trying to push forward a budget that is just uh, unacceptable through the growth and the stability pact uh, and the EU which sees the Italy as just a uh, unchecked uh, debt growth and we did see a couple of remarks specifically related to this uh, situation at the second at the end of the second day of the summit the European Union Commission uh, estimated that the spending growth plan would increase uh, their debt to GDP uh, status by 2.7 percent when the rules allow for an increase in spending uh, that would uh, equate to about 0.1 percent obviously way off the mark and uh, the structural debt uh, the uh, increase uh, relative to GDP would be projected to increase by 0.8 percentage points, where they actually have requested a, a reduction of 0.6 percentage points. Uh, clearly, this is they're on very divergent paths. Uh, and Junker said that uh, I mean the language in some of these statements was quite remarkable. Um, Junker suggested that there was a non-sanctioned 30 billion dollars in spending it from Italy already. Uh, that's that's the kind of rhetoric that's not going to draw a very uh, favorable response from Italian uh, leaders. But uh, on the other hand, we get to the uh, where the rubber hits the road. All this can be politics until we start talking about the possibility of a breakup of the eurozone, which would still be a long way away if if that is going to be a ultimate risk, and you can't write it off as a scenario. Uh, but the more immediate pressure, the, the pressure that we need to be concerned about is what it can do to the financial st status of Italy and the financial status of the Eurozone, which we are seeing very explicitly in the rise in 10-year yields for Italy. We could also see it in the FTSE MIB, which we saw earlier, but uh, I think you have a much more severe concern uh, in yields, sovereign debt yields. Now the magic number uh, and the magic measure is the Italian-German uh, yield spread, 10-year yield spread, uh, just like it was back in the, the Eurozone debt crisis. The figure that we're looking for is when it potentially passes four, uh, four percentage points or 400 basis points. If we get above there, uh, things are going to start to get tense very, very quickly. Uh, and we will definitely see far more headlines about uh, possible financial crisis in the Eurozone. And that will get to the point where it starts spreading over to the rest of the world, uh, or rest of the region, and then uh, it can be that uh, threat to broad risk aversion that is a little abstract now, uh, though it's starting to get uh, traction, uh, and it will be unquestioned about its implications uh, at that point. Now, we do need to keep an eye on this. Uh, this is going to be a good signal for the state of the uh, of the market. Uh, 
the spread is now at a five and a half year high, so obviously the pressure is on. Uh, it's un undisputable. Uh, the, uh, still, though, this is not necessarily self-sustaining. It's not full-scale risk implication, uh, but it is enough to sink the euro. It'll keep it under pressure, but at least the EU summit's done. It's just done without any kind of definitive outcome, bullish or bearish, in the relationship between the Italy and uh, e EU members or leaders. Now, the EU summit was also much more explicitly a, an event for the pound. Uh, this is the pound dollar, uh, kind of at a bottom of the wedge situation here. And uh, an equally weighted pound index looks more like this. Uh, you go down to a four-hour chart or shorter time frame chart, and you can see we, we cracked. So at least meaningful support. Now, the situation, as it were here, we would end the two-day summit without a, a breakthrough. Um, May suggesting again that the EU's proposals on the Irish border are unacceptable, and the EU saying that there's not enough progress that such that they see a need to uh, call a summit in November. Um, so they're kind of in a uh, in a limbo, and the clock is ticking. March 29th is the cutoff date, but we need to have clarity well before that because there are a lot of technical talks. There are, requi there are requirements of going back to individual uh, governments to get approval. There is a lot of, uh, of work that needs to be done between a loose agreement and a draft that's acceptable to all and the actual exit date. All right, so as yet unresolved, and as, as it continues to go unresolved with each day, it will be uh, adding pressure to the British pound. But... The potential is that uh, there could be a breakthrough, or at least a meaningful breakthrough on the, uh, the Irish border at least, and, and that can give a, a quick uh, stab higher for the sterling. So if you're trading anything pound, still ex very much exposed to volatility. There's a four hour chart of pound dollar. Um, but do be careful what your expectations are. Pound dollar, uh, if you think the pound's gonna hold up because it has a nice range support there. Uh, pound yen, if you think it's gonna continue down, also good because it adds the risk element to it. Now, in terms of what's uh, scheduled for event risk uh, over the next 24 hours, the final 24 hours of this trading week, there is very high profile event risk in China, as we talked about early, earlier. Uh, the UK Prime Minister is going to be briefing 150 C CEOs on the Brexit update. Seems like she's not going to give us anything or give them anything uh, too encouraging. The BOJ governor is going to be speaking. We'll see what he weighs in on global risks and uh, the, the what it's going to do to Japanese monetary policy. It's already floundering. Uh, trade in the Eurozone in Italy. So we're hitting upon key topics. I just don't think it's the opportunity uh, in these events to actually get clarity. The only thing that I think has really good potential is probably going to be overlooked. Canadian CPI. Why? Because this is pretty definitive about what is most important for the Canadian dollar now. NAFTA ha negotiations have been cleared. This is no longer the most pressing thing for Canada. The most pressing thing for Canada is probably reverting to what we used to be paying attention to before uh, trade wars started to uh, influence the U.S.-Canadian relationship, and that is interest rate expectations. The Bank of Canada is one of the more hawkish central banks. We forget that because the Fed is just all by itself. Um, but the Bank of Canada has already tightened policy a number of times over the past year and a half. And there is very considerable expectation of a further rate hike by the end of this year. And we have a rate decision next week, actually. So with all of this in the backdrop, we need to remember that this can be a meaningful catalyst if inflation pressures pick up. It's only going to reaffirm that a rate hike is coming, and potentially as early as next week. Because now they don't have to worry nearly as much about trade issues. So keep an eye on the Canadian dollar. I think it could uh, lead to some great potential. I will be watching pairs like the dollar CAD, yes, but uh, CAD yen, if it's a disappointment, risk aversion adds to that as well. Uh, also, Aussie CAD and Kiwi CAD, if there is meaningful disappointment, because these are wayward carry currencies, more so Aussie CAD than anything else. Uh, and if the Canadian dollar is going to continue to advance, then take a look at the weakened euro or the weakened pound. Uh, that can take advantage and uh, take advantage of shorter time frame opportunities, like on the pound cad. All right. Last thing I want to look at here is is crude oil. Uh, we do have a continued slide here, uh, but it's much more productive when it comes to the U.S. standard WTI.
accrued uh, oil contract. Uh, you can see we slipped back below that 2011-2016 uh, midpoint, which is about 70-20. Uh, we are now at about 68.50. Uh, we're just above it. Uh, but the same kind of enthusiasm for a pullback and short-term break was not and has yet to be registered for Brent oil, the UK standard. Uh, but if the pressure can maintains itself, these are still going on more uh, systemic issues, not individual supply and demand, but more so growth forecast and uh, and supply globally. So uh, we'll keep an eye on these correlations between these two assets and the spread between them. All right, we'll wrap it up here. We'll do our next rundown of these markets and final rundown of these markets tomorrow. Until then, I wish you all good luck trading out there.